All right. Um, like always, appreciate you guys coming out covering Penn State football. Um, you know, a couple things, obviously, uh, from last week. Um, you guys kind of, we already went over the UCLA uh, important statistics that we talk about each week. So those have been covered. You guys saw online. Um, I think the game, the players of the game and things like that. You know, the one thing I will say, kind of going back and watching that game and also, um, you know, during the game, I, I think they 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 found a quarterback. I, I think that quarterback was really impressive for his first start as a freshman. He's a big kid. He's athletic. Um, I thought he was poised. I thought he was very poised. I thought he managed the game well. I thought they called the game well for a first-time starting quarterback as well. Um but but um, that's probably the biggest thing that stood out to me, and the rest of the things have already been covered. So um, I'll move on to USC, uh, USC, and and Lincoln Riley. Um, obviously, Lincoln's you know got a history of doing some really really good things across his career, both at USC and Oklahoma. Um, obviously, USC speaks for itself, a uh, program with tremendous tradition and history. Um, and we're looking forward to this opportunity and the venue. So it should be, should be a great, great opportunity for us. You know, when you talk about breaking down into the specifics that our offensive coordinator uh, is Josh Henson. But the way I understand it, uh, Lincoln Riley calls the plays. It's been that way for a long time uh, with Lincoln. Um, but Josh, I've known Josh for a long time as well. Um, got a ton of respect for what they do offensively. They've been able to score points and, and put up yards uh, for a long, long time at a lot of different places a bunch, against a bunch of different teams. So it'll be challenging. And it's always challenging when they got a quarterback, and they do, uh, in Miller Moss, who's done some really good things in his time uh, at USC back to the bowl game last year. Um, it was completion percentage, touchdown to interception ratio. All those things are, are really good. Running back Woody Marks has been impressive on film. Um, just literally got done watching again the Minnesota game before coming over here and really did some nice things, um, you know, with their tackle wrap play. Uh, did some really nice things in that game. And then Zachariah Branch is a threat, not only uh, on offense as a receiver, but also in the return game. We'll talk about him more later. And then also number eight, uh, Jacoby Lane. Those guys are the guys that st stood out to us the most. D D uh, defensively, uh, Danton Lynn, who we know very well, is a, is a Penn State grad um, that they hired from UCLA. You know, came across town to them. Um, had a top fifteen defense last year at UCLA, and has done a really good job. Uh, already at his time at USC, um, you know, changing that defensive scheme and changing that defensive identity. So this will be a challenge. The guys that jump out to us is uh, defensive end number six, Anthony Lucas, uh, a transfer uh, from Texas A&M, linebacker number four, um, Easton um, Mascarenas Arnold, an Oregon State transfer. Linebacker number 18, Eric Gentry, who we know very well. Um, Arizona State transfer. And then safety number seven, uh, Kamari Ramsey, a UCLA transfer. So a bunch of transfers uh, on the defensive side of the ball that have stood out to us. And then on special teams, uh, Ryan Doherty is a special teams coordinator. And this is, a, I think, a major emphasis in this game um, is their punter number 16, um, Eddie uh, Chaplis, Chapliski, um, and then also obviously their kick returner, punt returner, Zachariah Branch um, has had a very, very explosive career last year and this year as a punt return, kick returner. So he has our attention for sure. So uh, that's pretty much the synopsis. I look forward to answering your questions. Open up the questions. Let's go to Rich Garcella, followed by Frank Bodani. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good, Rich. How are you? I'm I'm really good. Thanks. Are you getting closer or are you close to where you want to be as an offense? And do you feel like you've been getting the ball in the hands of your best players as we heard so much in the offseason? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know if we'll ever be where we want to be on offense and defense. Um, you're always, as as I know, coming in here, there's always going to be areas that we're going to um, be looking at and trying to get better at and, and being critiqued. I, I get that. I totally get that. And, and that's always going to be the case, right? Um, but yeah, I think, I think we are doing a good job, um, of getting the ball in our playmakers hands. Um, you know, specifically the guys that have been proven commodities already here at Penn state. I still think there's some guys, um, specifically at the wide receiver position that we have to continue to, to get the ball in their hands to develop that aspect of our offense. The thing that I do think is a positive is there's been a game where, you know, Omari's made some really big plays. There's been games where um, um, Trey's made some really big plays and been very productive. And and then obviously Liam this past week and, and Julian has flashed. So, like, I think that's helpful. Um, we'd like it to be a little bit more consistent. Excuse me. But um, – I think it's helpful that when you watch our tape or when you study us, all those guys have made plays at times. And that's concerning that it's not just one guy that if you stop this guy, you're going to stop their offense. And obviously our running backs um, and our tight ends, you know, have been doing it now for a while. Our wide receivers, I, I really feel like um, are developing and have really had a nice year so far. I think, you know, as you guys know better than me, that was a big question mark going into the season and a lot of discussion. I think if if somebody would tell you before the season kind of where we were at um, at the wide receiver position currently and, and you knew that before the season, people, I think, would be overall pleased, um, but not satisfied. You know, we still want to we still want to develop that area. And I think we're going to need to develop that area as the season goes on. Let's go to Frank Bodani, followed by Mark Wogenrich. Hey, good afternoon, James. Good hey, to Frank. see you. Hi. Uh, your offensive line. Can you talk about the physicality of it? Do you how much of a difference do you see in the in, in terms of that with your line, as far as that mindset, the mentality, the way they're going about blocking? Is it much of a difference to you from say last year, years past? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think we're more physical um, as an offense right now. Um, that that starts up front always will. And when I say up front, that's the O-line and tight ends. Um, you know, I think if you look at Tyler Warren's block and physical, um, uh, Khalil Dinkins had a couple really physical blocks on Saturday. The O-line, obviously, uh, Venga, you know, got everybody excited. With some of the things that, that he's doing, and it wasn't just the motion stuff. He did some other things as well. So, um, but it's also you watch our guys on the sideline. There's been some significant runs on our sideline punishing people that has gotten our sideline to erupt. But there's also been intimidating runs on the opponent's sidelines, finishing runs and not just running out of bounds. So I think we're more physical. I think it starts up front is your point. And I think we are more physical than we've been in the past. It's something we've worked really hard at promoting. And um, I, I think the guys are having fun with it right now and it's growing. And I think, I think we're starting to build a reputation of being a, a physical team, which, which is something we take a lot of pride in. Let's go to Mark Wogenrich followed by Mike Gross. Hey James, how are you? Good. How are you, Mark? Good. Thanks. What, uh, what will you need to see from Nick Singleton this week to make sure he can play Saturday? Yeah. Um, Again, I, I thought he was going last Saturday. Um, you know, uh, he didn't practice Tuesday, as you guys know, because I think you're out there on Tuesdays, right? It's Tuesdays you're out there? Wednesday, excuse me. Didn't practice Tuesday. Didn't practice Wednesday when you guys were out there and then was able to go limited on Thursday and was able to go limited on Friday, which, as you guys know, is not a whole lot. But the, the trainers take those guys and work them out on their own. So that's part of the evaluation. And then Saturday, um, you know, I wouldn't say he wasn't a hundred percent, but again, we thought he was going to go. So I guess my point is he was very close to going last week. So as long as we don't have any setbacks this week, I would anticipate him going. And and I also would anticipate him practicing, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday, but, 
but we'll we'll see how this whole thing plays out. Um, but but yeah, um, we're we're very confident. I think Nick's very confident talking to him on Sunday that that he'll be ready to go. Let's go to Mike Gross and then Johnny McGonigal. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good. How are you, Mike? Good. Thanks. Um, when we look at those uh, availability reports every week from the Big Ten. Uh, you, you, you've had every week, you've had 14, 15 names on it. I, it seems like more than any other team in the conference. And, and, uh, are, are you, how beat up is your team, uh, and, uh, compared to other teams you've coached and what kind of challenges does that pose other than the obvious, you know, it's better to have Nick Singleton than to not have him. But I mean, like in terms of player development, in terms of, ability to run practices what what are the challenges that that uh, poses for you i guess the first thing i'd ask mike is you made that statement about our team compared to others have you have you looked at that or is, or, or are you just saying that i have I looked just, at that okay yeah. okay uh, cuz i have not so i am going to i'm going to check that out myself but yeah i think i've mentioned to you guys um in here that i think we've had more you know, season ending injuries this year than in years past. And obviously that's not ideal. And that's where the development of the other guys and the depth is, is always important, but even more important this year. Um, a lot of those have been non-contact, just ones that guys just running, uh, you know, with, with, without a hit or rolled up on just, just happened. So, so, you know, we, we spent some time kind of looking at that as a staff and, and studying that to make sure that we weren't missing anything. But um, yeah, obviously you'd prefer to be as healthy as, as you could be. Um, I wouldn't say we're that. Um, as you guys know, I don't talk a whole lot about injuries on the front end, so it, it's hard to use them on the back end. Um, so you know, we just next man up mentality and, and keep plugging along and finding ways to develop and create depth. And I think Dady Lane's a good example of that. He's getting better each week. Uh, we're going to need to continue to do that at safety as well as other positions too. Um, but I think I think there's been some benefits. Quentin getting in this past week and doing some good things in, in the reps that he got. Um, you know, the, the challenge is how do we balance it, right? It's easy just to say play them. Um, but I, I also want to make sure that we don't look back and the kids don't look back at the end of the year and feel like I, I wish I wish I would have redshirted. And with the new rules, it allows you to to be strategic uh, and try to hold those guys as long as you can until you can't anymore. So that that's what we're trying to do. Let's go to Johnny McGonigal and then Neil Riddell. Good afternoon, James. How are you? Good, Johnny. How are you? Good, good. Uh, you know, obviously you know, we saw what Abdul Carter did against Illinois. I thought Denai was a handful against UCLA. And then Zane Durant's been a handful on the inside all season long. How would you assess the pass rush both on the interior and on the edges uh, so far this season, but more specifically Big Ten play? Yeah, I've been impressed with those guys across the board. I think I think your point, I think, is a good one in terms of Zane. Um, I think we've gotten used to around here defensive ends being disruptive. Um, I don't know the last time we've had a defensive tackle as disruptive as, as Zane. And now that that makes it challenging, right? You got a guy inside that you're watching on tape and it's it's a concern. And now you got DNs on either side that can be problematic. And, and where are you going to pick your poison? I mean, you know, you, you can't double them all. And if you do, then, then your back's not getting out or your running back, excuse me, or your tight end's not getting out. And, you know, we do some chipping as well and things like that. But, um, you know, a lot of times when you keep guys in, you know, people are going to add on. So that's not really always the solution. You want to try to get five guys out whenever you possibly can. Um, I do think Zane changes things for us and changes things for our opponents and makes it, it more difficult. I also think the depth that we have at D-Tackle um, and the size that we have at D-Tackle has been helpful, uh, not only for the unit and for the product productivity, but also to keep Zane fresh as well. So, um, you know, you know, Dion's doing a really nice job, him and Torrance, 
Uh, I think I think that position has done a, a really nice job, and I think Zane's been a guy that I think is becoming more and more of a leader uh, on our team and 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 specifically on our defense. Last question on Zoom, Neil Riddell. Hey James. Hey Neil, how are you, buddy? How are you? Good. Good. I um I was wondering what you're doing to try to get off to better starts uh, offensively. <clears throat> um, I'm presuming you guys script. Uh, the first couple series, but but I'm just asking if you're doing that or or just what steps you're you're trying to take to improve that area. Yes, sir. Uh, we do script uh, opening drives. Um, I think most people in the country do that. You don't always stick to the script. Um, but yeah, I think I think you know making sure that we get some early throws, high percentage throws, getting the ball in our playmakers' hands, all those types of things. Uh, being able to run the ball and get ahead of the sticks, you know, all those things are really important. And, and we spent a, a ton of time talking about it as a staff. Um, and also that's, that's part of your walkthroughs and, and things like that at the hotel as well as during the week. So, um, so yeah, you know, we, we are investing a lot of time in it and, and we understand how important it is. And there's nothing that we want more than on really all three phases we've done it some games on offense we've done it some games on defense we've done it some games on special teams you know it sure would be beneficial for us to do it in all three phases which i don't think we've done it in all three phases yet this year we'll go to questions in the room over here on the right mark is that right today good mark how are you doing great uh, what's the rationale for leaving on thursday and will you guys go from here or harrisburg yeah so that's a your second part of your question is a big part of us leaving on Thursday is we cannot fly out of state college. So that was a big part of our discussions with the Big Ten when all this thing got started is not only are we one of the most northeast schools, um, but based on runway length, um, size of plane, weight of plane, fuel on plane we can't get out of here unless we would stop for fuel so um with that we got to fly out of harrisburg so um you know to me that's one of the things i think we have to discuss is is increasing the the size of the runway here and the size of the airport for a lot of reasons for the university for the community for businesses for the athletic department and and for us now that we've you know decided to make this move as a big 10 to me that's something that that we need to do um for a, for a lot of different reasons um but that that's a big part of it is you know you're talking about adding another 2 hours to your trip on top of the flight. And I think the flight's already five and a half hours or whatever it may be. So um, that's pretty much a full day. So so that's one of the big reasons uh, for leaving Thursday. So um, feel good about our plan, um, but that's, that's a big reason why. And that's something that I think we're gonna need to look at addressing uh, moving forward because it does change things for us compared to a lot of other teams in our conference that either, you know, even if they are Northeast, they have an international airport and things like that, you know, within a short distance from campus. So we kind of got the double whammy. It's the distance as well as the airport. In the middle, John. Hey, James, how are you? Good, John, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Uh, we've seen you guys deal with some absences at linebacker for various reasons. How do you evaluate how that group has played this year? And do you think it's in a position to be ready to deal with what some of USC does offensively? Yeah, I think to your point, considering all the moving parts and we've had a lot at that position, um, I, I, I've been pretty pleased with it overall. Um, I think when you talk about, you know, Dakari, the, the whole story with Dakari, I think, He's probably playing better and gaining more confidence than, than you know, probably anybody anticipated coming in this season. Based on he wasn't even a linebacker at that at that stage, um, and is playing and and playing well. Um, Elsden obviously has played a ton of football around here. Deluca has played a ton of football around here. Having him back is helpful. And then also, as you guys know. Day Day Lane coming on at safety now also allows us hopefully to get to get um, 
brain fart. Thank you, Jay Reed. Um, sorry, Jay Reed. Get Jay Reed um, back playing the lion position, um, which which you know I thought in the beginning of the season he was playing really really well there. So um, the depth that safety Im- impacts the depth that linebacker and vice versa. Over on the left, Jared. Hey, Coach Franklin. Hey, Jared. Um, you had four games at home, five week home stretch, uh, really successful here. How well does that set you up to go on the road and go to California and execute? Well, I think we're in the season in West Virginia, which has a lot of similarities to California, right? Um, I do think that helps. Um, you know, that, that was a tough environment to play in, open the season that, that way. I think if you hadn't had one of those types of games, you'd be more concerned. Um, and, and you know, I think as a team, we know kind of our identity now. We're, we're in a much different place at this point. We know who we are. They know who they are. The other thing is we got enough film that you're not, you know, guesstimating who they're going to be. There's enough film evidence to to come up with a you know a real game plan on offense, defense, and special teams. So I think all those things help. Um, but you know, as we all know, going on the road uh, in general and going on the road in this conference is is challenging. So um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna pay them um, and the situation the respect that it deserves, and and we're gonna prepare that way. In the front, Audrey. Audrey. Good afternoon. Um, you mentioned Danton Lynn in the opening statement. Um, I'm wondering, is there any kind of connection between you guys other than him being here? Like, do you know him professionally well or at all or anything like that? No, I don't know him very well, but I think you guys know I've said this before. Um, guys from Pennsylvania, guys uh, that are Penn State grads, um, I track. And obviously the success that that he had last year. Um you know, obviously, he's a guy that 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 we had on our radar and have on our radar, and um, I want to make sure that I know where all the Penn State grads in the NFL and in college football are coaching, as well as Pennsylvania grads. I just think, excuse me, uh, Pennsylvania um, people that were born and raised in the state. I think that's that's an important piece um, to be aware of when you're putting your staff together. In the back there, Shane. Hey, coach. Hey, Shay. Um, UCLA obviously had had some some issues as far as you know their travel. It would have been a nine a.m. start for them back home. What are some time difference changes or challenges that you see for your team, and how does this prep maybe differ from say if you have a bowl game and you have more time to prepare? So, I'm sorry, one more time. Say one more time. So. Um, basically what I'm saying is the, what are some of the time difference challenges you anticipate and how does this prep maybe differ from like, say the Rose bowl or something like that, where you have more time? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's, there's two different ways of looking at it, right. And approaching it. You got the bowl game where you want to get out there early, get adjusted to the climate, get adjusted to the the time, all, all those different things. Um, and when you don't, then you just don't make an issue out of it. You just go, you stick to your normal routine, you play the game and you get out of there. Uh, I also think this is a time of the year where the weather is going to be somewhat similar. Um, I think some of the challenges with the bowl game is not just the the time zone differences and things like that. It's, it may be, you know, or, or is the middle of the winter here in Pennsylvania and you may be going to play a game in a climate that's very, very different. So that factors in. Um, so I think when it's in season, talking to all the NFL teams and talking to all the college teams that have done it, you want to try to keep your routine um, as consistent as you possibly can. But that kind of back to Mark's point, we have some challenges that other schools don't have that we have to factor into our decision-making process and our planning process. On the right, Tyler. Hey, James. How are you today? Hey, Tyler. Um, Ryan Barker is a guy that, compared to some of the other kickers, maybe not as much of a known commodity of guys who have started for you, guys who have gotten a bunch of FBS offers, maybe someone who transferred in like a Falcons. Barker didn't have those opportunities coming out of high school. So can you tell us what stood out to him about or to you about him uh, and your staff uh, when he was in high school and why he was able to get that walk-on spot here? I'm sure there's dozens of kickers in the state of Pennsylvania who would like to get that spot. 
Yeah, if I remember correctly, you know, we loved his statistics, we loved his 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 film. Then we met him, and he's a big, strong guy, so that that factored into it as well. Um, felt like he had a frame that could put on size and strength and increase his his kicking power. Uh, and then, if I remember correctly, he came to camp and and kicked well in camp as well. But we still, to be honest with you, didn't know what we were totally getting. And then last year he showed up and he was like, had opened everybody's eyes and was a, was a real pleasant surprise. And like literally was competing for the job last year. Uh, and then again, like I mentioned to you, you know, with, with less experience, uh, had competed at all, all spring and all training camp again. And, and again, you know, I would say probably, going maybe into the spring uh, or at the end of spring, if I remember correctly, he was the leader. And then early in the summer, he was the leader. And then Sander kind of gradually just slightly overtook him. Um, but it, it, it literally came down to the wire, but he's been a guy that since he stepped on campus has been really impressed. I think the thing that I've been most impressed with him is just how steady and level he is he doesn't get too high he doesn't get too low um he's got a very mature kind of way about him um i i've been i've been very impressed with him um very very consistent like you know it's one of these guys because the other thing is okay you have the statistics to say okay you made 91 percent of your kicks in practice okay fine but it, also the thing with him is it's like almost like a machine like a jugs machine or something like a large percentage of his kicks are right down the middle, you know? So it's not just the ones he's making. It's the accuracy of, of how he makes his kicks too. So, um, and then I think the big thing is we all know that's important at every position, but maybe even more at that position is how quickly can you flush it and bounce back? Um, and I, I think that's important at every position. It's probably magnified at, at the kicking positions because you just don't get as many plays and you don't get as many opportunities. So each play is magnified. Um, but that ability to flush the last play, good or bad, and move on to the next one is really important. And I think from what I've seen from him, he, he does a very good job of that. Let's go to Max. Hey, James. Hey. Um, kind of a Big picture question for you. Back in 2022, uh, you made a pretty pointed call to get bigger up front, uh, especially on your defensive line after the Michigan game. Last year, you finished number one in rushing in the country. This year, uh, I think you're number seven under 100 yards. And I think the number is 15 of the last 16. So how far do you feel like you've come in that situation? And we talk a lot about putting good weight on up front. Uh, and what do you attribute it to? Yeah, I think, I think we've made – progress there um obvious when you just look at the size of our our d line and and specifically our d tackles i do think it helps um even having a guy like deny who's an unusual defensive end at like 270 pounds uh and really a mean at 265 pounds so we're bigger there i don't know if that necessarily was the plan at dn it just those are the body types and and how those things worked out but at d tackle i think we were a little bit more strategic um, about that. Um, I, I think Zane is a guy that just athletically and movement wise was going to factor in. And he was a guy who was undersized out of high school and then probably didn't anticipate playing him as a true freshman. And then he came in and he was ready to play as a true freshman, but he was still undersized. Um, so that kind of impacted, you know, um, the size of your depth at D tackle. But now pretty much just across the board, we, we got good size. Um, yeah, you look at uh, Hakeem Beeman, he'd struggle with his weight for a while. I think he was like 297 last week. So um, I think it's been a positive for us. And, um, you know, offensive linemen are trying to get movement to the second level or to take the first level of defense linemen to the second level on double teams to the linebackers. Um, and when you're not able to get movement on those guys, I don't care what type of system you run, even if you're like us an attacking style front defense where we're trying to penetrate gaps and create tackles for loss and sacks. There's still times where the gap you're going to try to penetrate, they're double teaming you and you got to be able to hold point and five pounds can make a difference. Ten pounds can make a difference. 
you know, you look at Venga being 350 pounds is unusual, but size is a weapon, just like length and speed and quickness are weapons. And and that's one of them. I also think, they, I, you know, I, I can't not give credit to Pat uh, Kraft and, and Vinnie James um, and our chefs and the training room. Uh, we're one of, probably one of the only top 15 programs in the country that didn't have a football specific training table. Um, you know, my, my 11 years here until this year. Um, so I think that's been a, I think that's been a real benefit for us as well. Um, specifically this year, that's been a, a huge win for us. And it goes more than just calories and pounds. There's also an aspect of your chemistry and your morale on your team, uh, no different than the importance we all know is breaking bread as a family in your in your own homes. Um, th- there's value in that on your team as well, that after practice, everybody's going in there, having a great meal, laughing, spending time together. There's a ton of value in that as well. And that's one of the things I know that we're so excited about as an athletic department. This will be available to all the sports um, You know, next year. We're just kind of, we're just kind of in a, like a little uh, temporary space uh, for this year, but the entire uh, facility will be done for all the sports next year. And that'll be a huge win for our entire athletic department. Way in the back, T Frank. James, how are you doing this week? Hey T Frank, how are you? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Um, we talked a lot about getting Jalen Reed back to the line position uh, in reference to Dejon Lane, but part of that, transition would also be playing Zaki Wheatley at the other safety position. So I guess how has your assessment of his um, play been so far, specifically against the run or in pursuit? Zaki? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's playing really well. Um, I thought last week um, he was flashing and playing fast and playing physical. I think you guys also know I talk a lot about team defense. and A lot of times this guy gets a sack because this other – you know, defensive lineman penetrated and 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 um, made it very, very difficult for them to pass it off. It's the same way with safety. Sometimes tackling, it's a corner setting the edge on a screen where the lineman's coming to block him, and rather than running around the block, a lot of times running around the block is is the same as getting blocked. You're still creating space, uh, and the corner being able to set the edge and the defensive end pursuing and a linebacker pursuing allows the safety to play fast and confident because they're able to run an alley where the ball's going to hit, not having to make an open field tackle, which is very different in terms of how you approach it. So I think Zachy continues to play faster, uh, continues to play more aggressive and more confident. And, Again, I think the other 10 guys in the defense doing their job allows individuals to shine. Zachy's an example of that. The back left, Allie. Hey, how are you? Good, Allie. How are you? Good. You talked on Saturday after the game about the 5-0 and streak, the way that Penn State has been able to build those over the last few years as well. How do you use that as a teaching tool for the guys headed into the kind of more of the bulk of the Big Ten schedule? What we've done is good. How do we build on that? especially when you couple in what ha- what's happening in college football right now, this week in particular, what Alabama, Tennessee, Mizzou, Michigan, USC, all these schools falling from the top 15. How do you use all of this as a teaching point as you head into more of the bulk of your schedule? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's just, just like I talk about after wins that we're going to try to enjoy them for a couple hours. And then it's, being able to recognize these things and all the hard work that goes into it and not take them for granted. When you're able to say you're the only team in the country that has started five and Oh, four straight years. When, when you're able to say those types of things to me, that's impactful. And I want the staff to understand that. And I want the players to understand that consistency is something that everybody's working for and is hard to do. Um, I think this week was, was a really good example of that. Um, when you're also able to say that not only did you do something that, that you're the only team in college football that's done that, but you're also able to say it's the first time in Penn state history that that's happened. 
Those are things that the players should be proud of. They've done that. Uh, the staff has done that. The, the coaches, the assistants, the equipment people, everybody, they've done that. So I, I think it's an opportunity after the game to recognize those things, uh, make them understand that those things are special and don't take them for granted because a ton of programs would love to be able to say the same thing. But at the end of the day, all that matters is that we're one and oh this week because if we don't handle our business and be one and oh this week, that stat that we we're talking about won't won't mean anything. So um I, I think there's a time and a place after the game to recognize all the hard work that's gone in to us being one and oh that week and and however many one and O's we've been able to stack and and address that and recognize that. Um, to be able to recognize a guy like Liam Clifford, first career 100-yard game, be able to recognize a guy like Tyler Warren who breaks the touchdown record at the tight end position, you know, or whether it's Parker going in and making those field goals, which were awesome to see go through the uprights. Um, you you want to recognize people's hard work and then, and then move on. Uh, to the next task and the next the next goal and the next next objective so that that's what we try to do and and to me there should be some confidence that comes from those things which you can take into the next week um and then there's also a ton of things that that we got to get corrected but i think that's part of my job is after the game is is be able to show them these things, recognize it because the next day we're going to come in and watch the film and we're going to spend the majority of our time on what correcting the mistakes and the things that we did wrong. So um, you, you, we want to make sure that there's balance, right? Got time for two more questions in the back. Andrew? Hey, Coach. Hey, um, Andrew. We've talked a lot about the uniqueness of playing USC from a travel perspective, but i just kind of curious, maybe put your, your fan hat on for a second. You're watching tape to prep for USC, watching them play Minnesota. You've played UCLA. Now you're heading to USC. Is this kind of still unique for you as a coach to kind of understand and look at what the new big 10 looks like as opposed to what it had been for so long. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've ever done what you said, like put the fan hat on, there'll come a point where, where I will. Cause even when I watch other teams, I don't watch them like, like just a fan. It, it It's, it's too much of what we do. And, and our lives to just watch it like a game, you know, like a fan. I'm I'm sending things. Hey, this play happened. I want to show this to the team on Sunday. I'm sending it to Jevin all night long. Um, so I think I told you guys I tailgated for the first time in my life. I've never done it before. Uh, what concert was that? Uh, Luke Holmes. Luke Holmes. We you know, ate hot dogs. So like that was cool. Um, but I haven't really done a whole lot of that. Um, so, you know, I, I think for us, in my mind, I don't necessarily look at it the way you just said. It's it's the next team on our schedule that we got to find a way to beat. And a lot of ways, it doesn't really matter whether it's a conference game or a non-conference game. For us and what we're trying to do, they're all significant. I made a comment a few years back about this win was no different than another win and people lost their mind about it. But, um, but the reality is for where we're at and where we're trying to go, you know, each week is the Super Bowl for us. And we try to approach it that way and give it the right amount of respect. Um, try to be as informed as we can try to be aware as uh, as aware as we can of what the environment's going to be like, what the locker room's going to be like, what the stadium's going to be like, all of that so we can try to replicate those things during the week so that when we go there, our guys aren't aren't surprised. Like even little things like, you know, I, I'll show them pictures of what the locker room's going to look like, what the sideline's going to look like, all those things just to try to get our guys as prepared as possible. And I think we had talked maybe a week or two ago about that's some of the things that when we go and scout hotels and opponents that's the stuff that we're doing with our travel people that are setting all of our travel up ahead of time yep last question in the front mike mike since your uh al neil's not here in person i'll be the wet blanket today 
I think my math is right. If after those five and oh, you're the last three years, you're 13 and 11. So what have you learned when you divide the season in half like that, that you can apply to what's coming up, which is a really challenging stretch? Yeah, it's it's continuing to do the things that that we have to do each week uh, as the schedule gets more and more difficult. Um, we play in one of the best conferences in all of college football, <clears throat> which is going to create challenges. Uh, I think we have three teams right now ranked in the top four. Uh, that's what comes with that. So you, you embrace what comes with playing one of the best, you know, conferences in all of college football um and and those challenges come with it so you know we got to do the things that we've done to this point to get us to be five and oh that's something that we can control we got to make sure that we're doing it for the long haul and that's as as the schedule goes on and as the opponents get more and more challenging uh and as you have bumps and bruises and things like that that affect depth you got to find solutions um to give yourself the best chance to be successful Thank you, Coach. Thank you.